Thanks so much for, for doing this. Thank you for having me. Right. Um, so the first question I have is just, um, why do you want to be sheriff? Um, well, you know, I've, I've, I've been in the sheriff's office for nine years, and I have been told for the majority of that that I need to run because of the way I pretty much handled my units and how I handled the inmates and how I took care of the officers and stuff. And it wasn't until the audit of 2018 came out and actually we were back up, not when it came out, when we got the email saying we're going to be audited. And we looked at some of the questions. Uh, we knew there were issues. We were losing people left and right. And we kind of had an idea um, of what was going on. Um, so when the audit came out, it was perfect. And so I was telling all my people, you know, you, you need to be, we need to, we need a voice. You know, this is the one time, if this is true what they're saying, this is an anonymous audit, then we need to be heard. You know, now is the time. But we pushed it, we pushed, and I pushed. Never in a million years would I have thought that 93% of the staff put in for it, but you know, did the audit. That really was a mind blower. But what, what blew me away the most was when the results started coming out, then the fingers started getting pointed to. And I, at the time, I was a sergeant for about six months, and the fingers are being pointed towards us, the sergeants, the first, the frontline supervisors. We were the cause of everything. And we're all like, um, wait a minute, we all just got promoted. This stuff's been going on for years. And so how are we at fault? So over time, the issues, we're still losing people. The issues were still, were still occurring. I'm getting more and more upset with what's, with what's going on, I'm not being happy anymore. You know, and this is a profession I've loved. I've been in for 17 years. Um, I truly love being a law enforcement officer, but I don't want to be at work anymore. And we actually had an issue that stemmed from the audit with another supervisor. And I actually, I was on overtime. I actually requested to go home. I said, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to be here. And I sure don't want to work for this particular person. And so I got sent home and I talked to my wife about it. And she's like, you know, you've been playing this idea for months Stop playing. Let's do it. Those guys love you. They, they, they want you to be their leader. So do it. And so I put my notice in the next day. And the day after that, I got put on administrative leave. <laughs> they found out why I was leaving. And we've been planning ever since. And here we are. We're in our third week now. So my next question is about your qualifications, um, but I guess you've been kind of talking about that already. Yeah. So you were actually a, a sergeant when the audit came out? Yes, yes. I've actually been doing this for 17 years, and not all with the sheriff's office. I've been with the sheriff's office for nine years. Um, I was promoted in seven, which people told me I was, well, could be totally unheard of, and I, I blew them out of the water. Um, I actually started in the private in the private sector. I was we worked from the federal side of Las Vegas um, with the Federal Bureau of, of Prisons. We were a private organization. Um, the, the big thing with, with, the, with the private prisons take over. I actually worked for one. Uh, we were very similar to the diversion center that's here in Athens. Um, our job was to um, get the inmates ready for society. Um, they came to us at the last ten percent of their sentence. Um, so our job was to get them, get them released, get them out, and um, being prepared to uh, be productive citizens. And then I moved to Georgia shortly after that and worked at the Department of Juvenile Justice with them for about three years and uh, put myself to the police academy and I've been with the sheriff's office for the last nine. Okay. Um, why do you think you'll make a better sheriff um, than your opponents? Which one? <laughs> if you're talking about my, my former boss, Sheriff Iowa Edwards, um, I would think uh, mostly because I care. I care about the agency. I care about the people that work there. They're our family. You know, um, one of the things I, I, when, I, when I did my opening article that I had mentioned was with our work schedules, we spend more time with our, with, at work than we do with our families. And in time, you, you, you start growing that bond. You, you become, that's, that's your new family. You know, so, you know, I've, I've known, you know, everyone within, within our ranks. Um, I know their families. I've watched some of their kids grow up. Um, I built a really strong rapport with them. Um, with the sheriff, it was, and even when I first started nine years ago, um, I never thought it was true until I actually started, started looking. But the running joke was he never knew who you were, even though that's the man who swore you in. 
That's the man that made the final decision whether or not you got a job with him or not. But if you, if you ever watched him, if you walk up and he'd shake your hand, he'd look at your name tag to see who you were. And with 160 people, that, 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 that kind of means something. You know, it means you don't know who your people are. You don't know anything about their people. Um, some of the things that he had said when we're going through the audit and we're trying to get things, um, I guess the, the storm had hit us and he had a lot of meetings with us. And some of the things he would say was, I don't have to be around to show you that I care. And that's totally false. You know, they want to see the sheriff around. You know, they want to see that the leader of their organization actually does care about them and there for them, you know, when the, when the need is. Um, what makes me better than, than John Q? I've been there. I've been there nine years. I've lived it. I've moved up the ranks. I've worked in courts. I've worked on the road for three years in Warren Division. Um, I've seen what, it, what it's like out there on the road. I know what, it's, what it, it takes to run the biggest liability of the sheriff's office, and that's the jail. I've done it 14 of my 17 years in. I've worked behind the fence of some capacity. So with all of that, it just, it just you know, I know these guys. I know how it works. I know how the inner working of the sheriff's office is. So it just makes perfect sense, you know, for me to run it as a new sheriff. John Q's got some great ideas. I'm not taking nothing away from him. He's been in this business about as long as I have, if not a little bit longer. But he's PD. He all his ideas is if he was running or applying for the chief of police. You know, great ideas, but we're not the police department. We're the office of the sheriff. We're a constitutional position. We're in charge of the jail, the courts, and any paper that comes from the courts. That is what we do, you know? So it just makes perfect sense that I'd be the one to run it. And what will your top priorities be in the first year in office? Ah, getting that morale up, getting some officers built, get in there. Um, the morale is, is just, it's probably at its all time low. I've, I've never seen these guys so miserable. And a lot of it is because of the overtime that they're working. They're, they're working their tails off in that jail. And actually not just the jail, the organization as a whole. Because now we got court people working overtime at the jail. We got road people working overtime at the jail. I just found out that we now have been pulling road jail people that are certified, that are road certified to go help out in the road and in in, to go do transports and stuff. Um, so the morale's got to get has got to get brought up first. Uh, well, first and foremost, and I think the change within the sheriff's office is going to be that beginning. Um, some of the things that I, that I want to do with um, um I got to get with HR, look over the budgets to see if it's if it's you know if we can do it in the budget. If not, we'll we'll move some stuff around and make it make it work. But these guys get paid overtime one day a month instead of every two weeks like a normal employee does. So if they get paid every two weeks, they're at a lower tax bracket, they see more of the money and they see it right away. And I think that will, that'll bring them up a little bit more until we get this, the staffing issue taken care of. Next thing, next thing we do is get recruitment going, get it back. They were running it when I, just before I left, we were bringing people in the door. We were, we were starting to, we were starting to look at overtime numbers starting to come down and then as always and as usual, they halt or slow the recruitment. And now they're back up to four or five days a month of mandatory overtime. When when I left, we had these guys down to three. Recruitment is is is, is going to be the top priority, you know, to help get this help and get help get the morale brought up at the same time. Um, there's actually agencies out there, you know, it, yes, it's a nationwide norm, not nationwide, but it is nationwide issue that law enforcement are having problems with staffing. But there's agencies out there that are at full staff, that have waiting lists. And those are the people that I'm, that I'm looking at. Those are the people that I'm talking to. What are you doing to get to the level you're at right now? And one of them is here in Georgia and, and they're in Metro Atlanta and that's Alpharetta PD. They're a full staff and have been for a while. And all it is is just pretty much what we have been talking about all, you know, all along, taking care of your people, Take, empower them with, with their jobs, letting them do their thing. You know. Yeah. Um, so also in that recent audit that was done at the sheriff's office, um, there were other problems as well, like some deputies reported being retaliated against for bringing up issues they face day to day in the jail. They say there's a culture of fear and intimidation 
in the sheriff's office and also favoritism shown to certain employees. I was wondering how you responded to that. Um, working there for nine years? Yes, it happens. They don't like a voice. They don't like someone expressing their opinion, especially if it's the truth. You know, I've seen people be promoted because they are consistently part of the um, Sheriff Big fundraisers, the golf tournaments. There's people that, that are always participants, whether they're actually playing or whether you're at where you're, where you're contributing to the, to the cause. Those are the people that have been moved up, whether in positions or promotions. The, the click, the good old boy syndrome, whatever they call it, is going to be over come January 1st, 2021, when I take office, because it's, you got to earn it. If you want it, show me what you got, and we'll go from there, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that good. Uh, so the sheriff's office was criticized by some community groups in 2018. Mm -hmm. or cooperation with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Yes. And um, you yourself have um, already posted that, that you support the 287G program. I was wondering if you could explain what that program was and why you support it. Yes. Um, actually, and you're correct, too, that when, 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 the, when the immigrations hit pretty hard, I actually, um, the sheriff came to me because he found out, as you'll find out here now, I am actually part Hispanic. Um, I'm 29 percent. I'm 25 percent Hispanic. My 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 on my mom's side, we're from the Michoacan region in central Mexico, which is just actually south of Guadalajara. And even though I'm not totally fluent, I know just not to get me get myself in trouble. But I don't know a whole lot of Spanish. But he actually actually asked me the question: What would you do in this in this situation? And I told him point blank. I said, I think these guys are being stereotyped. When he chose not to no longer cooperate with ICE, that was a perfect move. No longer accept detainers. Because a detainer, by law, is something that does not occur into a, in a jail. A detainer is a traffic stop. A detainer is a person walking down the street that, that, that has reasonable suspicion of doing something or probable cause of doing something, and an officer stops and requests to talk to the person. That is the detainment. When you're in jail, you're on formal charges, followed by either an arrest warrant, a traffic citation, um, or any paper that says that they are supposed to be in that jail under arrest, okay? When immigrations would send their detainers, yeah, we were holding them, as like every other agency across America, for 48 hours once they finished with us. When they finished with us, they were no longer on formal charges. They're just being held for 48 hours. They're being detained, which means we were holding them illegally. And you got a smart person come in the door and say, you know, I'm going to file a lawsuit against you for, for false imprisonment. They would have won because they, we were holding them against their will. They were done with all of their formal charges, their criminal charges, whether it be aggravated assault all the way down to driving with no license. We should have cut them loose. When I was in warrants, my let, each warrant officer had a letter group. Mine was F, G, and H. I used to joke because it was the, most of them were Hispanics. So I had the Valley of the Hispanics, okay? But when I go knock on a door and most of them were fair to appears. Most of them were traffic charges for fair to appear. So I go knock at the door and I finally be able to talk to someone. Nine times out of 10, they're telling me immigration's already come and got them. I'm like, when? A day or two after they got released from jail. I'm, okay, well, I guess I better go tell the bonding company that they've been, they're either in Atlanta or they've already been deported, depending upon how long that warrant's been. And then they would tell me, but they also took my mom, my dad, my sister, my uncle. So what immigrations would do is they would run everyone in that house. And whoever was undocumented, they took. Because of the one person who broke the law of the land, whether it be something as minor as driving on a traffic violation, well, tri driving, driving, driving on a um, no license, or on a domestic violence charge, those charges isn't what got the person deported, but that's what got them in our jail, and that's what raised the red flag with immigrations. The 287G program, I looked at it, 
It keeps everything in house. It keeps everything in the jail. We deal with only the person that was brought to us. It keeps immigrations out of our backyard. What it does is it, we, we send however many people I want. My plan is just to send one person. It could be a test pilot program. Send one person to South Carolina, get them trained for four weeks, bring them back. What the 287G program really is, is a database of people, illegal immigrants, or I'm gonna rephrase, immigrants worldwide that have warrants that we don't know about. But it would involve training um, a Clark County Sheriff uh, to be an immigration officer, basically, and to cooperate with ICE? Um, yes, and paid for by immigration and not the sheriff's office. So um, why do you support that? What's that? Why do you support that? Program? Because I want immigration out of our backyard like everyone else does. As long as we deal with the, end of the person that's in the jail only, immigration is not going to go to that person's house and run everyone there. So I want to see if it works. Okay. Actually, I've, all, I've also reached out to other sheriffs. There are six well, other... What would it mean to you to have it work? What, what would that be like? What's that again? But like, if, if the 287G program works and you wanted to continue it, like, what would that look like? Um, getting more people trained. Trained to be immigration officers? Well, trained to be DIOs. Detention, infor detention... Oh my God, um, I didn't write down the actual. Um, they're, they're called DIOs or detention, detention immigration officer, I think, is what, I think is what it is. But I'm not for certain. I guess what okay. I'm going to ask is do you support uh, deporting um, uh, undocumented demons? <sighs> that is a tough question because, one, America was founded on immigrations. My family came from from Mexico. I don't want to say I support because when something like this happens, they are taken away from the families. I'm a family man myself. I have I have you know a wife and, and kids myself. And and I and I wouldn't know you know how I would feel knowing I'll turn away from my family. Watching the news you know, seeing what's going across in the border states, you know, it, 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 yeah, it, it sucks, you know, being, you know, watching those kids being torn from their parents. So it, it's, it's difficult to say that I support something, but what I support is the people who are here that are, I don't want, it's, it's, not breaking the laws of the land because I think if you're here on a no, on driving a no license charge, come on, that's a hundred eighty five dollar citation, go away. But if you're here on murder, or you raped a child, or an aggravated assault, you stab. If you're on a violent crime, then yes, you need to go. You can't be here. That's the support. And this is why I think we should at least at least try the 287G because there's out there, and we've actually got stats. I looked, I looked, I've been a lot of homework waiting for this. Fiscal year 2018, there were 700 um, immigrants deported. Um, 670 were convict, convicted from dangerous drugs, 150 for sex offenses and assaults, 150 were obstructed to the police, which. I didn't know. I don't know what, if it's fighting the police or if they're actually running from the police. If it's running from the police, okay, that's kind of a stupid stat. Is that from Athens? Um, no, this is just this is the the twenty seven G program as a whole. Oh. Um, um, I don't have I don't have the the stats for Georgia. I'm still actually in the research phase with this. The twenty seven G, in all honesty, you know, yes, I'm looking at it, but it's not my top priority. It's not going to be as soon as I take office, this is what we're going to do. I've got bigger fish. I've got to fry. i got bigger issues. I've got a short staff that's about 30% short staffing. i got an overtime issue that needs to be taken care of. I've got a lot of the people that I've stood by you know, and worked by for nine years that needs a break. The people that work in that jail and work in the sheriff's office, those are going to be my top priority. You know, if I, if I get to this two, three, four years from now, okay. 
if I don't get it to my first election and I, and I decided to run it, run on the second term and we, and we, and we look at it in the second term, okay, this is going to be my top priority. Okay. And, and I think that's probably where I didn't quite get the message out when I, when I first, when I first saw this program. I don't have any more questions. Is there, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Or you... mm, no, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing this with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.